Hey everybody, so I feel like every so often I stumble upon these interviews where Kishimoto just uses them as an opportunity to throw some shade, and I feel like they're hidden gems. So I want to talk about this one. This one was brought to my attention by someone named Michael Vivian. It could be Michael or Mikael, I don't know. Sorry if I butchered your name, but uh, thank you, Michael. Now the interview is actually originally in French, and I think like after all this time, a fan uh, took it upon themselves to translate it. Link in the description. You can, you can check it out down below. This is actually a pretty old interview. Like this interview took place before the actual end of the Naruto manga. So, you know, a fan uh, translated this. Now we have this. And again, it's, it's very, very insightful in terms of like Kishimoto's inner workings and mentality uh, during this time before he actually ended Naruto. So the first question that the interviewer decided to ask Kishimoto is why are there so many orphans in Naruto? Are you interested in that character archetype? And at first I thought that was kind of a lame question because if you look at young adult fiction or stories that involve young people, a lot of them, especially shonen, uh, have like some way of removing the parents from the main storyline. Maybe not by death, but maybe they're just not not always there, you know, because it's a coming of age story. So obviously the main focus has to be the main character who's like a teenager, right? So it's like, why are there so many orphans? Because it's an easy way to get around the parents being there and solving everything for the kid, unless you make the parents part of the problem that the kid has to deal with, right? Uh, but anyway, so Kishimoto was saying how he grew up with a family, so he didn't really know what it was like to not have parents, not have a family. He was never an orphan, but he did have friends that either didn't grow up uh, like in a like a, I guess like a like a traditional family household with two parents or he did have a friend who was an orphan and the guy was kind of resentful because he would tell him you know families parents can be a source of conflict and Kishimoto says that he kind of agreed with that but he also felt like his friend was actually projecting his own issues onto him so because his friend didn't have parents he was telling Kishimoto you know, huh, I'm kind of glad I don't have parents because they can be a source of problems. And so Kishimoto made a mental note of that. And not just from that friend, but from different friends, because friends would turn to Kishimoto for like, I guess, uh, for advice or for counsel. And Kishimoto would try to help them as much as he could. But he did notice that there was a lot of psychological pain for people that, you know, came from, from uh, households where there was just one parent or no parents. So and then that ended up influencing a lot of the premise for Naruto, which I think speaks volumes for as to why that aspect of Naruto is so relatable and people can connect to it right away. Because if you think about it, we all end up being orphans at some point. Then Kishimoto is asked about the sense of community in the series and how sometimes these bonds of people that do not share the same blood are actually stronger sometimes than their actual family. He says that this influence came from the region where he grew up in, where people used to get together in groups called kumis, and basically each member of the community would, would treat each other like family. Like they would cultivate food for each other, dine with each other. If there was a funeral, uh, the people of the group would usually occupy the same seats as a family member would. And so it was this understanding of this very deep sense of community that ended up making it onto the page and influencing the village system in Naruto to the point where I think it even influences what's going on in Boruto because that's one of the biggest problems that Boruto has with Naruto is like you don't spend enough time at home you know you've neglected us like you don't go to Himawari's birthday what's going on and so the answer that we get is that being a shinobi but also primarily like having the responsibility of being Hokage entails thinking about the entire village as your family. In the interview, Kishimoto also spends time talking about his designs and some of his artwork. He said that he made the designs colorful and very different from the stereotypical ninja costume, which is, you know, you know, kind of like black and, you know, just, just stealthy and stuff. Because he was, he was just tired. He was like, I'm not going to do the same thing that has been done over and over again. There's no point in using that, that sort of like ninja design in my story. I want to be different. So he kind of went in the opposite direction and gave Naruto an orange jumpsuit. He also mentions that he's obsessed with zippers and loves drawing toes and feet. He even jokes about it and says that it could be a fetish. So all those things kind of ended up coming together and influencing his character designs. He also mentions how Akira Toriyama, obviously Akira Toriyama, 
and Katsuhiro Otomo are some of his big influences when it comes to art. Like even from a story standpoint, he says that the fact that Naruto ended up being divided in two parts was also partially inspired by Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z being divided into two parts, being the hero's journey uh, divided in two. Now about Toriyama's artwork, Kishimoto says this, he says the bodies are not realistic. They're disproportionate and sometimes simplified to the extreme. This could be mere awkwardness and clumsiness, but it's not. Everything is mastered and has a purpose. I love how easily readable his panels are. The actions chain up with each other perfectly, and it's all made very clear for the reader to understand. So he's kind of just fanboying over Toriyama in that section of the interview. And now from Otomo, he mentions a manga called Domu, A Child's Dream, and talks about the crazy perspectives in those panels and how he feels like Otomo is just such an amazing artist because he feels like he has like a digital camera inside of his brain and is able to translate that onto the page. He drew a lot of his influences from European comic books and Kishimoto thinks that Otomo is the first one who really removed the barrier between manga and cinema. He says that Domu uh, was like reading a movie and that before then Kishimoto never realized that one could have a cinematic experience just by reading manga. Kishimoto also talks a little bit about the villains of his story and how he made a deliberate choice to not just have them be bad people for the sake of the story and just be like, ah, these are my powers and I'm the bad guy that you have to beat up. No, he actually takes time to create a sense of empathy between the villains and the reader so that the reader can understand the character a little bit more because he feels like that's, that's kind of like a cliche for Shonen where it's like, you just have like this this antagonist or this villain and you don't really get to know anything about his motivation or his his background so he would always give us information via flashbacks this is where the flashbacks come in about the psychological profile of any antagonist or villain so that we would have a better picture you know in terms of like okay why why is this character doing these things okay yeah oh okay i kind of understand it you don't have to agree with the things, but you, you kind of like empathize with them to a certain extent. And I think that's what made a lot of the villains and antagonists in Naruto so rich. And that made these characters uh, one of the best parts of the Naruto story overall, to the point where I still miss some of these characters and how fleshed out they were, because you would get to know them and then you would realize, oh, like this person is actually like a like a normal human being, you know? At one point, there were, there were regular kids, there were regular human beings. It's just that they experienced pain or trauma and they, they didn't cope with it the right way, or they coped with it in a very unhealthy manner. And so you understand that pain, even though you don't agree with their actions. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, again, even now, like, I love One Piece, but I, I do feel like this is something that One Piece could use more of, a little bit. And I think that's one of the reasons why Katakuri ended up being one of the best parts of Whole Cake. Now, to be fair, there are some examples of characters where Oda does decide to sort of expand or give us a little bit more information on their backstories, on their background, like the Fishmen, the Fishmen that, you know, like became kind of like villains of their respective arcs. Like he, he introduced the notion that Fishmen historically have been oppressed and uh, been discriminated against by humans. So that's where they learn to hate. That's where they learn to be racist against humans or discriminate against humans. Also, we have characters like Do Flamingo, who we, we got some character backstory and we found out that, that, you know, he really is a psychopath from the get-go. Like he, there was something off about him from a very young age. You know, he killed his dad, so he was already messed up. And then we also have the character of Big Mom, who from a young age had like an illness, uh, some type of mental disorder, uh, food-related craving disorder that she just couldn't control and ended up causing her a lot of pain and abandonment, unfortunately. Now, Oda won't be able to give everybody a flashback like Kishimoto did, uh, and I don't think he necessarily wants to do that because I think Oda has made it very clear that one of his main priorities when it comes to One Piece is the world building. So sometimes you have to, you have to pick and choose, like, what do you want? What's more important? the world building or giving everybody a flashback. And sometimes, like for Oda, it's clear that the world building is, you know, one of his priorities. And I totally appreciate that for him. All I'm saying is like, I would like to get some some info, some more background out of characters like, let's say, uh, Kaido, maybe, or Akainu, uh, Blackbeard, for sure. And then we get into the most shocking revelation out of the entire interview. And it comes out of Kishimoto being asked about the dynamic between Naruto and Sasuke. Kishimoto says, that, you know, thinking about, as he's thinking about wrapping up the story, he absolutely knows, okay? He's 100% sure that Naruto and Sasuke cannot exist without each other. So if their issues get resolved, if they find a way of working out their issues, there will be absolutely no point 
in continuing the story further, which I think kind of answers like why Boruto has been so meh lately. It's because I feel like there, there's nothing in terms of character dynamics in the Boruto series that even comes close to the bond and the back and forth that Naruto and Sasuke have growing up. Maybe this could change now that Kawaki has been introduced into the story, but as of right now, I just don't know. And I'm also not feeling a lot of your enthusiasm for this show as of this moment. Like I even made a poll asking you guys what kind of content you would like to see more often on the channel and Naruto and Boruto related videos were not even in the top three options by the end of the day. After the poll closed, after the poll ended, Naruto related videos were not even in your top three picks. So moving forward, I hope that changes, but to be quite honest, like as of right now, again, this could change, but as of right now, Kawaki just feels like a total clickbait character. He was used as clickbait in the beginning, in the opening chapter, and right now, I, I just don't know what to make of him. Anyway, moving on. This is the revelation. This is the big, the big thing that really surprised me, like especially coming out of Kishimoto and the fact that the main character of the story is Naruto. Kishimoto admits, he says, that in the beginning, meaning in Naruto part one, Naruto really did not understand Sasuke. During the fight of the Valley of the End, Sasuke tells Naruto to shut up because he has no idea what it's like to lose a family. He tells him, you were an orphan. You were on your own right from the beginning. How could you possibly understand what it feels like to lose all of that, right? Kishimoto actually agrees with Sasuke's statement in the Valley of the End. And he says that Naruto, because he grew up an orphan, he really doesn't understand Sasuke. It is only until Naruto loses Jiraiya that he can kind of begin to understand Sasuke's pain, but by that time, Sasuke has already left the village, so he can't really communicate with him. He can't really like talk to him about like what loss really is. Kishimoto says, and I quote, I feel closer to Sasuke as I would never be able to forget or forgive the one who murders my family. I can see myself in the way that Sasuke reacts. See, I told you guys that Sasuke was the best character of the show. Okay. But anyway, the main difference, Kishimoto says, between Naruto and Sasuke is that when they experience pain, Sasuke uses that pain for hatred and revenge, whereas Naruto uses that pain for reflection and actually thinks about Sasuke about what not to do with that pain. Kishimoto says that Naruto survives pain and loss without abandoning himself to vengeance and hatred, realizing the difference between self-interest and public interest. And then he also says that as the characters grow older, there's a bit of a role exchange because in the beginning, Naruto is driven by emotion. Like he's very emotional. He just runs his mouth and, you know, just, just does stuff based off of impulse and he's very reactionary. His personality is just very rambunctious. Whereas Sasuke in the beginning is very cool, calm, and collected. But as, as the story moves forward and they get older, Sasuke becomes much more emotional in his decision-making process, and Naruto becomes a lot more calm and, and collected when it comes to facing challenges. So there's like, a, there's like a role reversal there. But then going back to the point where he says that Naruto really didn't understand Sasuke uh, and his loss, at least not in the beginning stages of the story. Kishimoto, I mean, <laughs> this revelation is just like, what is going on, Kishimoto? Like, look, so this is what he says. It's right there in the interview. He says... And to be completely honest, overcoming traumatic experiences like Naruto does seems a bit idealist and naive to me. Even though this kind of utopic idealism has to be written and defended in shonen mangas, shonen mangas must carry hope above all. So this is what he's saying, okay? He's saying, I lied. He says he relates to Sasuke and that Naruto's way of viewing things is just, is just naive. It's too idealistic for the real world. But because of the genre of, of shonen manga, he felt a responsibility to give us as readers hope. I feel like he's saying that a part of him really didn't believe in his own message. Like, I feel like he's saying that, you know, it's good to be hopeful, you should have hope, but in reality, let's get real. Like, this, this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Like, the fact that Naruto says, to never give up, like, you know, that, that, that sometimes doesn't really work out. 
uh, in the real world. And I'm not gonna lie, like when I first read this, I was kind of depressed. If, if this interview is true, all right, it turns out that he really didn't believe in the hope that he was offering, um, which, you know, it's okay. Like, you know, he's human. Uh, we don't we don't always have to be hopeful. We can be cynical at times, but it's just like and and by the way, this doesn't negate like the amount of people that he's touched, uh, that he's been able to motivate and influence through his manga. But it's kind of like that old joke where like the circus clown or the comedian that makes everybody laugh turns out that he's secretly depressed. Like you're still making people laugh, so it's a good thing. But I, I just I just don't want you to be secretly depressed. Now that I think about it, this aspect also kind of like could potentially connect to the end game pairings of the show, which are Naruhina and Sasusaku, because a lot of the complaints coming from the the opposite side, uh, like in, in Naruhina's case, Narusaku, right, was that Naruto and Hinata didn't have a lot of interaction. They didn't have a lot of development as characters, uh, and so it wasn't really like I guess realistic for them to end up together. But I think that's kind of the point. I feel like that Naruto and Hinata getting together is is hopeful. It's a hopeful message that you can have a crush at one point and you can end up with your childhood crush, you know, and it's 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 like a good thing. It's like, you know, it's a positive thing. You have something to look forward to. Does that happen in real life? Uh, for the most part, no. But that's I think that's what made it so special. And I also think that's one of the main reasons for why people supported that pairing in the first place. It's because it's like, yeah, no duh. We know that this stuff usually doesn't happen in real life, but, you know, you can still have hope. Um, and as Kishimoto said, like, hope has to be there. Uh, it just has to. It is, a, it is a fundamental necessity for the human condition. Like, I'll even put it on me for a moment here, okay? Like, there's been days where I, I feel like I don't want to make videos anymore. Like, I don't even want to get out of bed, okay? And it's, and it's hard, but... I, I know that I have to push through because part of what I do on YouTube is that to a certain extent, not always, but you have to, you have to lead by example. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like sometimes life straight up sucks. All right. It's, it's just horrible, horrible, you know, filled with pain and anguish. But at the end of the day, you always have a choice. Okay. And you can decide what kind of attitude you're going to have in, in the face of those circumstances. So even even if Kishimoto didn't 100% believe in his own message, I don't, I don't think it really matters all that much because the message was already sent. It's already been published, all right? And uh, each of us gets to decide, like, w what to do with that. I'm sorry that this video got kind of dark towards the end, but I think it's real and hopefully you can appreciate it for what it is. Um, thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Catch you guys later. Bye.